Damon Alban, welcome. Thank you. Up to Amsterdam, good to have you here. It's wonderful. I mean, it feels like autumn, but we're kind of into winter now. Yeah, this is what you call royal morning blue It is, sky. indeed, but um, surely the leaves should have gone by now. Yeah. I think uh, leaves on trees in November. It's not good, not, not a good sign. Well, I mean, just, I'd just like to see it from the tree's perspective. I'd like to hear what they've got to say about it. <laughs> you have a new album coming out. Yeah. It started out as some sort of project for an Icelandic festival. And no, no. I started off as uh, a project for a French festival. A French festival? Oh. Yeah. Uh, but I chose to... To it make it, it in Iceland. Make it in Iceland, yeah. uh, in my house, looking out my window. Because it was a commission, I, had, I was able to bring some really great musicians over and sit with me and look at look at the landscape and kind of somehow find language to play to play what we saw which outside of my window in Iceland is uh, directly outside of it is a, a kind of bit of heathland and then there's a little lynx golf course then there's a black sand beach then there's a, a bit of ocean then there's a little island and then there's a mountain range and then behind that there's a glacier and a volcano. It's the ultimate image to score a record to, right? Well, it's an interesting one, yeah, because, you know, this, it's very dynamic and uh, full of kind of big kind of climate related sort of stuff. I can see over the last 20 years how much the uh, the glacier has receded. You can actually see that happening right in front of your house. Exactly. What does it? What does that change to the landscape? I mean, just the snow, or just the ice disappearing, or does the whole landscape? Well, that's in the distance. Change? You can't see that. You can only see that on a very clear day. But you can see that it's there's less now during during the in the winter. It feels like it's the same, you know. But 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 in the summer months, you can see it's definitely less than it used to be. Um, but that's true of all glaciers, they're yeah. all sort of slowly receding. It doesn't snow as much as it used to, so so when it begins to snow again it feels optimistic. When you know, the, it's raining and then the temperature drops and it turns to snow. Um, that's what you're describing in this, in this yeah, song, Yeah, but everything right? slows down, blue. it's like, you know, if you're talking about the climate change kind of conference this week in Glasgow, it's, yeah. it's, you know, it's what we want, isn't it? Which is slow down climate change because the implications of it are so sort of so uh, profound. For, that's something that's interesting, humanity. right? You have you have the climate, which is a much larger and bigger scale thing than the weather. When you look outside, you get this sense: okay, there's snow. This is a good sign, but yeah. it says nothing, of course. No, yeah, of course. Yeah, no, no. Well, well, yeah, but. No, exactly, and and if it's in the middle of summer, it, <laughs> it's probably yet another sort of alarm bell. Yeah, there seems to be a sense of isolation in this record, which is probably at first inspired by the the setting you were in, this this landscape, etc. Mm -hmm. It seems to be an appropriate theme for the kind of era that we all yes. got into. I, th I, th I think I was making a record that when I started it, I mean. Yeah, exactly. The environment I was in alluded to those kind of that that kind of condition, you know that that perspective. You know, the ideas that I'd been playing around pre-pandemic with the project fitted beautifully into the state yeah. of state mind of that I was in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just that it's just it's a fluke that the two come together but you know it's kind of it happens a lot i see a lot of records i think oh, this is a, the typical pandemic record this yeah. must have been written during yeah. isolation and then you ask a musician and he said no 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 all the songs were written before well that's a wonderful that, but, thing but but, but but that's what mm, i think all good artists are are doing they're picking up on the future before it happens because you know we we we, we have these this weird idea that that everything is kind of sort of is like now, but it's not. We're we're still carrying the residue uh, of the past and 
connected to the future. The, the, the future already exists. It's all, everything's already done. So how does that work? Can you, what, everything's I mean, already the future, happened. The future is coming on, right? That's, everything's that's happened. A, that's something, everything's already everything happened. Everything has happened, so you have to move into the future. So how do you get that well, sense of what's going to happen? Or, I mean, it was from when I was a kid. It was, I used to have this, the, these flashes of this revelation, and I could never hold, hold on to what it was. And then as I got older, I kind of... I was able to understand it and the, the revelation was that the future is the past and the past is the future. So how do you look back on writing those songs and seeing this all happen and thinking, hey, I was writing about the future again. How, how does that situation reveal itself to you? Well, I mean, I've been writing songs which, you know, I mean, Demon Days is pretty kind of sort of prescient really if you look at apocalyptic some, I suppose if you write about the apocalypse you know at some point you're going to get it right aren't you <laughs> <laughs> that's true that's true so what did you miss most the traveling or the touring I didn't really think about it in those terms I accepted what it was and kind of lived in the moment both of them are really important to you right the, sure you are pouring inspiration from 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 the world Yes, I've, I've, I do. I, I, I love putting myself in, in new frames, new perspectives. So I, I, I adore that. So how did you do that now? Now that you were like all of us, more bound to well, I being home. Well, I sort of, you know, travelled in my head really, and I swam as far as I could out to sea, without. Not drowning. in Iceland. No, in Devon. Yeah, 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 right. You know, that's as far as I could go. So I, I swam to my limit. And in a sense, that was the same as traveling, you know. There's this image of traveling that pops up in at least two songs on the yeah. record, which is a cruise ship. Yes, yes. That's a very important part of the record. Is, yeah. It's an empty cruise ship. Uh, like a ghost. Yes. It's, it's almost like the empty spaceship that we've seen before in your yes. some of your yes, videos. exactly. Where did this image of this ghost ship come from? It's a kind of recurring dream I, I, I have. Of is it a nightmare or is it actually some sort of it's, it's beautiful thing? I think the music that, that's played in for no one is beautiful. You know what I mean? Like you did on, on Glastonbury last year. Yeah, I really, I mean, to for, an me, empty that field was, of people, for me, actually. that was perfect, you know. <laughs> I really enjoy it. It's my yeah. favourite Glastonbury. Why? Because, because, I mean, Glastonbury is all about the sea of people, right? No, it's not all about that. It's, I mean, uh, this was more about the, the, the land of Glastonbury and the, 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 the spirit of Glastonbury, you know. It was wonderful playing in the middle of nowhere in the countryside. I love that. What is the spirit of Glastonbury with no people? Well, it's a very ancient spirit, actually. You know, it, it goes back, I mean, it goes back thousands of years. It's one of those those places which has a, a, uh, a very strong, you know, spiritual signature, like... There is something in the, yes, in the ground, actually. There is, yeah. exactly. So back to the cruise ship, have you ever been on one, on, on one of these floating cities? No, but I always, I'm always fascinated by them. I always take photographs of them. What fascinates you but about But there them? was one during lockdown out in the bay where, 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 where I live and yeah. it was there it was there for at least a month it was it was a ghost ship as it you was imagine. a ghost ship yeah. it was exactly and uh, every night they switched the lights on so you know I could sit on empty beach looking out at this it was a long way out it wasn't I couldn't swim to it you have these these images of the Venetian uh, shores where this giant ship oh, doesn't yeah. stop. Jesus it's, it's, Christ, it, that's, yes. a, that's a great image, right? Of, yes, of the unstoppable image. force of yeah. Saint Mark's, humanity on... St. Mark's, this beautiful Renaissance building, and then this thing behind it that's like twice as high, you know? Yeah. Which, which, is, which is, has no soul. So why did you put this ship at the South American coast um, in your song? Uh, because um, I needed to get there and that was the best way to get there, you know what I mean? And 
the Tower of Montevideo. Is it an actual ship, the Tower of Montevideo? No, or Tower of Montevideo is a tower. Oh, the tower in, in the city. It's, it's, yeah. It was built by an uh, 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 Italian architect in the 1930s. So it's got that kind of sort of modernist, fascist kind of atmosphere about it. But it, it, it originally had a lighthouse on the top of it and it had a cinema. It's an apartment block, it wasn't a hotel. So mm. it's an apartment block that had its own cinema, its own lighthouse and its own uh, ballroom and restaurants, which is 1930s. That's quite a vision of the future. You know, so. so what's your connection to that specific building? Um, well, the two times I've been to Uruguay, I've just been obsessed with it. You know, I haven't actually been in it yet. I've looked into it from, from quite a high elevation and just, I've drawn it, I've drawn the whole building. I've, I've thought about it a lot. So it was a nice place to get on my ship and visit. See during the pandemic. From the ocean. Yeah. yeah. This, this, this song, the, the music of it, 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 it has this South American touch, mm. which is in the, in the drum machine that you use. Well, the, the, see, I, these, these were the decisions I made. I decided to take my oldest drum machine, which is a 1954 Wurlitzer. But it's so it's like really, really pre-anything. Pre-anything, yeah. And it's, it's, it's got all those kind of sort of Latin jazz drum patterns on it. So I didn't have much choice. You had to. <laughs> I had to do that, yeah. So uh, that, that was one of the prime instruments you used for this yes, record, Yes, I made right? decisions. I was like, well, what am I going to make this record with? Okay, I'll take that. And There's that. a synthesizer, which has a very distinct sound. There's a few synthesizers, but they're, but they're, they're, they're early, early synthesizers. And because it, I was recording in, a, in, in an old, cold stone barn, they, they didn't work properly most of the time. So, you know what I mean? It was like touch and go in the morning whether they'd actually make a sound. So why was this the instrument that you wanted to use? You just pick them and well, okay, have a go like with all, it? I don't know. I just felt they were the closest things I had to the atmosphere that I'd kind of been working with in Iceland, you know. Because in Iceland I'd had the orchestral instruments and, I, and, I, and I'd taken an old Hammond organ I had and a harmonium and a piano up there. So it was in that sonic world, so I felt that was it. To me, it starts, at the start it feels kind of cold. After two th songs there's Royal Morning Blue and it, it blooms up. There's suddenly yeah. a lot of warmth and hope and... Mm new energy flowing into the into the album which yeah. is due to the drum patterns mm. and also to the saxophone of course which plays a big role in this yes. in this record a big big role yeah did did you actually want it to to bloom after a, a few moments did you think about that well i think that's kind of in in still holding true to the you know we used to start the workshops before the morning light. So, because in Iceland in the winter, it doesn't get light until like 11. Mm. So if we started like half nine, it'd be dark still. So it's that cold, dark uncertainty and then... It blooms up the... the yeah, and that's, that's that moment. You know, yeah. In the day, so to speak. It's like a sort of, it's a day, isn't it, really? It, it starts off, the record starts off with a song that pays homage to the late great Tony Allen. Tony Allen was a very important musician in your life. You've, you've, you've worked with him very, for very important a... important person in my yeah, life. Person yeah, personally. What kind of person was he in your life? Uh, well, he was, he was very much a, like a uh, significant teacher. What did he teach you? Oh my God. He taught me how to uh, play with my eyes closed is a big step. Why is that a big step? Some people don't know anything else. What, than playing with their eyes yeah, closed? Yeah, they, they're blind. No, some people, you, you often see musicians who don't dare looking up and you just play with their eyes open. You, for you, it took some learning to... Well, 
to play with your eyes closed. It's a different thing playing the piano with your eyes closed and looking at where your hex is. A big, yeah. it's a big old place, the piano keyboard. So it's your your, your spatial awareness it takes a while to be able to do that. I think. I mean, yeah. I mean, I used to close my eyes when I felt awkward on stage as a singer. That was a way of dealing with... But actually crowd. creating music with your eyes closed means you... It's a very different thing. It's a different, different experience. Yeah. You're playing like a, someone who's blind, really. Uh, so you have a different relationship with the whole physical thing of, of creating. There's more jeopardy when your eyes are closed, but to get over that you have to just you just have to become very uh, fluid and, 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 you know, you can't be self-conscious if you've got your eyes closed playing a piano. How did you start working with him? Because you meet a lot of people, you work with a lot of people. How did you um, know that you well, wanted I first, to do more? I first started with um, listening to, to, to Fela Kuti and then I listened to his solo records and then I I sang a song, a Blur song, called Music Is My Radar, which sang about, had a line about Tony Allen in it, and someone obviously heard that, and he ended up saying, ah, oh, would you like to come and do a tune with me, and then... He was a big collabor collaborator as well. He worked with a lot of people during his career. Yes, absolutely. I mean, yeah. Maybe he had to, um, in, uh, considering well, the role drummer. that he was uh, playing as a as a drummer. Yeah, I think it's a drummer. It's interesting yeah. if you if you listen to, for instance, some of the songs on your uh, uh, Good to Bad and the Queen mm. records. You you hear, it sounds like he's taking the lead with the rhythm. Yeah. Whereas probably most of the songs, most of songwriters start with melodies or rhythm. Drummers well, coming last, or to, how does Tony, it work? He, he, he's to, so profound. If you're going to work with Tony, you have to kind of go with him. You know, what I mean, you have to follow him. It's, so that's what he does. That's what he. And that's probably what you want to want from him as well. Absolutely. I mean, it's it, there's no other. There's no nobody played the drums like Tony. <laughs> what What is it that made him so distinctive? It's light. The lightness of touch. Yeah, the pulse. The pole. I mean, you know, the pulse could change. If he'd had one too many whiskies before we went on stage, the pulse could be slightly erratic. But when it was really in the groove, you know, I mean, the thing about Tony is he liked to play for like two, two, two hours at least. So a like on an and hour, on. Yeah, an hour-long concert full of songs that last only like three minutes. Sometimes for him was, you know. He'd like a good twenty-minute song is that's that was his kind of sweet sweet spot, you know what I mean? This this line, the nearer the fountain, mm -hmm. more pure the stream flows. It it to me it, it also means like when you're true or close to the originators of music, the pioneers of music, you get to drink from their water in a way. That's one of the things you could. One of the ways you could interpret that line. Yes, you, you've it is, done yeah. that a lot, right? You've yeah, I've done a lot. A yes, a lot of originators. Absolute. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Oh, from mean, from from Bobby Marky Womack. Smith, Bobby Womack. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, all of them. Yeah, Lou Reed. Does it always work for you? Because there's also the saying: you shouldn't meet your heroes because it's always it will disappoint. Does it? Does it? That's not the way you think. You just. It's not Go easy sometimes, you know, it's not, because nothing's ever going to be how you imagine it. So, yeah, I mean, I've, you know, I suppose of all the people that I were, I mean, I had the, Tony, t Tony I've had, I had the, the longest and deepest relationship with, but I also had a very kind of dear time with Bobby Womack. I, I went on a world tour with him, made a, a solo record for him got to know him very well. It is sometimes, I, I don't mean this as disrespect at all, but it seems mm. also like a kind of a collection to you. A collection? Yeah, all the songs that you created with all mm. these people seemed like something, like you want to make something with these people you admire and yeah. you look up to or, or, or think they're great thinkers. Or it, 
it seals them into your life, so mm. to speak. Yes, I mean it. it, it you can also collect records, but this is a, a more beautiful way of collecting, yes. right? Well, well, but well, well, you have to. Well, it, it, what I'm saying is, it's like it's not easy to do it. It requires because it's not just like, hey, how you doing? Let's make a, you know, for example, someone like Bobby Womack. He, he kind of hadn't done anything for ten years when I called him up. He'd been sitting on his sofa in L.A. just was he because was, he didn't know what what else. To do, he was out of ideas. I think, he, I think he, yeah. I mean, maybe he was just, he was just re a recovering addict. Mm. Um, he'd concentrated on other things in his life. Um, so think, you had to convince him it was to, a good to, idea to, to make something to come back new, right come into back. that mad world that he'd kind of sort of. I mean, was, when you're was, a recovering was, was addict, it's a dangerous himself. world as well, right? Absolutely, uh, totally. I never forget when we were rehearsing in Burbank, and uh, a sly stone was um, in the opposite uh, rehearsal studio because he was rehearsing for Coachella, mm. and Tony was very. I mean, I mean, Bobby was very anxious that day because he was one of his old kind of. Uh, Addiction buddies. Addiction buddies. Yeah. yeah. So he he really didn't want to hang out with him that day, you know. Wow. Yeah. So how did that work out? You you just yeah they just kept, kept kept them separated. Yeah. Well, they kept themselves. So, well, he kept himself separate. He just you no. Know, but I could see. I could see he was like nervous. I can imagine that. <laughs> yeah. Sly didn't ever enter your studio, did he? No. Sly Stone. No. I, I mean, can imagine he's something that's very important to you musically as well. Oh God, yeah, oh, I can love the things that the textures of his songs, absolutely, and the production yeah. of yeah, the I mean, way he it's just, it's writing. just, it's, it's, I suppose it's kind of can it's 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 a huge challenge when you when you try and work with someone who you adore, you know, and has been a, very influential. To you, because it's it's actually really hard to, to get something that has any integrity. You know what I mean? It has to be good enough to live up to your memories of their music, yes. their own music. Yeah. Do you throw a but, lot of but, do you throw but, a lot of but, those but, collaborations but, but, away? But but in the in in the sense of it, is it a menagerie or not? No, because there's no uh, door or or cage. It's just you know I come into their lives, they come into my life. You know and it's terrifying for them, terrifying for me, and not because I'm their hero or anything, but just sort of, you know, when when you've been kind it's a of vulnerable situation. It's a vulnerable situation. The thing that we started this conversation with the, the, the traveling <coughs> part is mm. also important in this aspect of your work. Um, I, I, it so it seems to me like you actually want to meet those people. Uh, yeah. Do you often work via email or we transfer uh, stuff? Um, I did during. Pandemic. You just had to. Had to, yeah. Yeah. No choice. I mean, I prefer to be in the room with someone. So now you have this world-dominating situation, which is a pandemic. You also have this new situation in Britain, which is called Brexit, which has unrolled in the past couple of months as well. How bad is it really? I definitely feel we're we're we're, we're under a cloud. Under a cloud. We're under a cloud. Yeah. I mean, we are generally under a cloud on in England, you know, and Scotland and Wales and Ireland, just because we're on the edge of a huge ocean. Um, so we get all the weather first. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but no, I think, yeah, I, mean, I just think spiritually the country is a bit lost. But I mean, I mean, you, you've Cold. written, you've written about this before a lot, it actually yeah. uh, happened. Mm. Do you think that people, now that it's unrolling, are starting to see what happens, or maybe changing their minds, or uh, does, does it does it it's change hard. I think anything? It's very, I think it's very hard for people to admit that maybe they made a wrong decision. That you know, the whole thing about Brexit is really. I never really realised how emotive it is. You know, the people's reasons for voting Brexit were so uh, eclectic. You know, some people. I know one, one, one of my one, one of my parents 
old friends uh, voted Brexit, even though she's a signed member of the Communist Party, she voted Brexit because in the 70s her parents had sold their apple farm to a French company. And that so seems like a, there, there bizarre, was a, a mistake. Bizarre. A bizarre reason, yes. yes, and that she's resented that, yeah. even though she's an internationalist and a communist, she still kind of voted Brexit. I just don't know how anyone could do that. Um, so that's just one example, one 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 example of, yeah, people, you know, people were voting for so many different reasons, and you know, the weirdest thing about it was that they were voting with the people that probably made them feel like that in the first place. You know, I the, the the, the right wing and the conservatives, you know. So it's it's very messy. It's, uh, I mean, personally, I think it was idiotic, you know. But that's that puts me in a difficult position in my own country where I think the majority of the people acted in an irresponsible, belligerent way, you know. And it's very hard, it's also very hard for them to to come round to a different way of thinking because that they created this mess, you know, and it's hard for people sometimes to admit that they were wrong. They were wrong, but clearly they were wrong. What does it mean for you as a travelling musician? Well the implications are massive. I mean it's not just it's not so much me, it's the younger, it's the young next younger generation, you know, who who now have to pay for visas. On top of all, all the, the 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 myriad protocols of of of, of COVID, so you've got this dub this, this dub double cost. It's very prohibitive for 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 young artists to travel now in Europe. And so the whole once the festival scene, hopefully next fingers crossed next year is back up running. It's, you're not going to see so many. Uh, uh, British bands you, you, traveling no, the, no, the continent. No, yeah. and but but that's such, you know, such an important part. I mean, I remember when we started in Blur, our, the, our first year in 1990 of summer festivals changed our lives. I mean, these things are important, you know. In what way did it change your life? Just opened my mind. It's like, wow, I'm I'm in France. I'm in I'm in Sweden. I'm in like. Poland, I'm in Lithuania, I'm like... You now have an Icelandic passport, right? Yes, What did I, you have to do to get that? Uh, uh, nothing. Nothing? No. So I could go there and get one no, too? No, absolutely not. You've been living there, you've been having, you had a... Yes, I mean... A, a I, home f- there for 20, 20 years, 20 right? 20 so. years, yes. I mean, there are two ways you can get an Icelandic passport. You either, you either learn Icelandic work there and live there all the time or you do what I did which is kind of sort of get given it as a kind of as a gift. Is that a rock star privilege? I don't think it's a rock star privilege I think it's I mean you know it's 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 if you really want the the economics of it it's I help contribute to the tourist explosion in Iceland 20 years ago and it's in what way because I was one of the first people to go to Iceland and talk about it they acknowledge that as one of the they reasons to give that, you that's one of the main reasons yeah. yeah and you know I I work with Icelandic artists I've I have a house there I've lived there not as a resident not a as a, How much time do you spend there, actually? Um, well, I mean, actually, uh, before the pandemic, I was going there a lot because I was work, I was doing this project. I was going for a long yeah. time. I mean, you know, I I love Iceland. Uh, I didn't I, di- I didn't ask to become a citizen. Um, it was it was a very very generous gift that they gave me, and I uh, I did not. Uh, I don't kind of turn these things down, you know, even though, uh, I mean, when I was in Mali, when I, I was given a, uh, uh, I, can't, I was given an honourable name and had a whole long process of going there and 
going to the, the, this uh, a area 100 miles outside of Bamako where the Kamasoko clan live and been had my new name whispered to me by the imam in front of 5,000 people. You know, that these, these things are, they're things I think you, you need to accept with utmost humility, mm -hmm. uh, but also kind of, you know, I mean, the implications of what happened in, in Mali were quite real for me because bizarrely, a few months later, I got a letter from the Queen saying, hey, we want to give you uh, a, an honour. And my family Queen background, Elizabeth. You're yeah, my, fam my, yeah. my family are very much Republicans. In fact, my, on my father's <laughs> side, they're all, all conscientious objectors. And really, the last thing I would ever do is kind of uh, ally myself with the royal family. But mm -hmm. because I'd already accepted this, this, this thing. This honour from Mali. Mali, yeah, to, yeah. to me, personally, as a... As a human being, it seemed terribly hypocritical if I turned down something the queen. from the Queen, yeah. from my own people, yeah, you know yeah, what yeah. I mean? So I had to accept it, you know, with utmost humility, and, you know, and move on with my life. But I don't walk around like I'm... You're not having it No, 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 on not your... at all. Not at it's, all. But it's interesting, right? Not at all. I'm, so I'm... in Iceland, it's a similar sort of thing. It's like, I didn't ask for this, but now that you've offered me it, i uh, I'll accept it. I will accept will. it. I will accept it, and I will take. It, it I will take the implications well, right? of it very seriously and honour it. You know what I mean, as much as I can. All the other people who got it uh, in defence of, of of Iceland's kind of uh, citizen kind of dispersal program is were, were all from Syria or from uh, Africa, or from Afghanistan. Fugitive people exactly. from, from or war everyone countries. Exactly, everyone yeah. else on the list, apart from me, who obviously stu <laughs> stuck out like a sore thumb. <laughs> You're a Brexit fugitive. A Brexit fugitive. <laughs> I mean, does it actually exactly. make a difference? Because Iceland makes a huge does difference. have different kind of yeah. agreements with the European Union than, yes, than, I, than I, England I can has. Yes, I can still go through the European... That's, yes. that's a big thing, right? For me, it's very yeah. important, because I see myself as a... As a European, I'm, I, I hate I hate the idea of us being cut off from Europe. I hate it. But this is the reality. I mean, when when you think of but I mean, thankfully not for me. No, when you think of Tony Allen, for instance, mm. back to him, it was well known back in the day when he was playing with Fela Kuti that mm. they had a big band and it was hard to get visa for all these musicians <laughs> because I mean the reality was. Quite a lot of them wanted to stay in Germany or France or wherever they were. Oh touring. yeah, I mean the the the, 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 the I mean there have been musicians. Oh, I forgot what his name was the Congolese guy who, yeah, he got in a lot of trouble because he was you know that he was making a lot of money out of uh, so-called uh, uh, band members to, yeah. who never seemed to go back. You know what I mean? Yeah, but I mean Tony was very much very much of the mind that there shouldn't be so much movement and that they should stay and you know, help the country, you know. It's, uh, it's, it's a did very he, Did he still live in Nigeria? No, he, lives in, no, he, no, lives he lived in, in, in Paris. Right in Paris. He yeah. lives in Paris, yeah. yeah. So actually, that's a hard <laughs> thing. I mean, for his career, he had to do that. At the same well, time, you can be convinced it's important for well, the he, country to he, stay. He, he found uh, uh, Lagos too hectic. It was way too too problematic for him to live there. Much preferred yeah, yeah, yeah. a suburb of Paris. So now you're actually in the good line for the airport, thanks to a very generous Icelandic exactly. government. Exactly, thank you very much. And I still feel European, which is important so, so to me. Yeah, how do you think this will be working in the long term? This, this Brexit. Do you think I it's think, a, it's I a think, situation I think that in just has years, to be I think in 10 years' time, we're, we, we, we'll come back with our tail between our legs and say, can we please come back? You think so? I hope so. I just think it's, it just doesn't make any sense the, uh, being so sort of uh, aggy with your own neighbours. It's like, you know, France, Holland, Belgium are our very real neighbours. They are. 
and we really should be getting on better with our neighbours. It's a sort of, it's 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 a, it's, it's impolite to be so belligerent, and secondly, it's impractical. And and and, and the shit that it's caused in Ireland is just unforgivable. You know, after what Ireland's been through, you know what I mean? They. What kind of shit do you mean then? Well, the border, the, yeah. the border between the north and They're south. They're stuck, right? They're stuck. stuck behind England. Exactly, and that's just not fair, not fair or right. How do you see your role now in the, in the, uh, in the, the new generation of musicians in the UK? <laughs> where do I see my role? I mean, Is there a role well, where, for you? Well, do, do they see me as having a role? I think it's more of a question. Would you like to? I don't know. I mean, I just get on with what I do, you know what I mean? I, when Brexit was happening, we were looking at lineups for festivals. Are there any British headliners or new talent coming up? Are they? Yeah. Do we see a difference? Of course, the pandemic was all over it, yeah. and and it changed, shuffled everything mm -hmm. again. You were on a headline spot for Down the Rabbit Hole over here. Mm -hmm. You were ready to go, even though I guess Gorillas is a pretty expensive uh, production to put on, right? It's really? not something you like load into a van and get going. No. There was a kind of a risk you you were you were willing to take to oh, yeah, get it going. Oh yeah, sure, sure. I'm I, I'm always prepared to. I, I always put the music always comes before any other consideration. You know. How but does I that mean, work? But, you because know, you, you we, knew we may in the future see gorillas reduced to just me playing the piano <laughs> <laughs> and some cartoons. Yeah, <laughs> I don't you know. know. No, you know, no. but the, it, won't, the, it won't be like that. I, I saw the show in, in Zigodome. You had a lot of guests. That's that's what you want to do as well. You well, get within, people from all within directions. The co within the context of gorillas, yeah, it's, it's it's about it's a kind of like it's a it's it's sort of it's just every time someone new comes on, it raises the the temperature a bit. You know, it's it's like a relay. You know, I always imagine all these momentum. people all these people traveling together as well. Yes, that's it. That, must be a, a, an exciting bunch. It's on fantastic. The, on the back, it's back really, side it's of really, this. It's, a, it's a I love it. It's great, um, but it is one aspect of what I, I am. You know what I mean? I, I am also because this is bringing all the people together, and, and the record that you made now. I mean, you've worked with other people, with some close people uh, yeah. that they've worked uh, a lot with. At, at the same time, it seems more you. It, yeah, it's, it's more zoomed it's, into. It's, yeah, it's just that's why it's called a solo record. I mean, not because I did it all on my own, but just because it's definitely more about me than if I'm doing gorillas or whatever. You know. Does it change the, the way? you write the songs as well or could you just as well write the same topics yeah for a gorilla song yeah i mean it just it just depends hmm. you know so now you have to choose are you are you going to or you could do all of them are you going to be back with gorillas on the road next summer or are you going to do this or are you going to do both are you going to going to start with this and then i'm going to do that do you look forward to seeing the sea of people again? I've seen the sea of people already oh, this year. Of course, you did uh, UK uh, yeah. festivals. Yeah, so the, it's great to see the sea of people. I mean, I I love that, but it's uh, you know certainly don't take it for granted. Thank you so much. My pleasure for your time. It was good talking to you. Yeah, good talking. I love to the you. record. I can say Thanks that now. I always say that when it's done. So it feels fair. Yes, it's exactly. You don't want to say it at the beginning. Thank you so much.